Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Courtney and I'm the graduate intern for the Disability Service in Trinity and I've just recently graduated studying uh, business and sociology and I'm also a student, I was a student with disability myself um, and profoundly deaf and wear cochlear implants. So I'm just going to go around the virtual room and if you can give an introduction to your role in the service and well in Harry's case why you study and so I'll start with Harry if you want to give a bit of an introduction. Sure so um hey guys my name is Harry O'Brien I'm a fourth year management science and information systems student and I have autism so and I'm involved with disability service as just as a volunteer on the side um, and the, the reason I got involved is because I came up to college from Cork and um, I just I pretty much wasn't mature enough to move up to uh, and live by myself and go to college by myself and I ended up failing four exams and um, so then after, it was after that that I realized okay I gotta get my, my stuff together so I got onto the disability service and I've been working with a lot of them since and just on my own disability and helping them with other projects. So, uh, sorry, Courtney, is this where I kind of talk about the importance? Of the um, I'm just going to well? go. I'm just going to go around the room and just, okay. just a brief okay. intro. Okay. Then we'll then we'll go back to Harry. Uh, okay. So next up is Claire. Thanks, Courtney, and uh, good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Claire. I am one of the disability service staff team. Um, and my role is as an occupational therapist, but I also work with some students as their disability officer. So for many years in the disability service, I have worked a lot on our pre-entry and orientation activities. So um, running events for prospective students before they come to college to let them know about the disability supports and then running our orientation programs for students who are entering Trinity. Um, I also have a special interest in the area of uh, neurodivergent students. So at the moment, I'm just beginning a Trinity neurodivergent project to specifically look at the, the needs and the resources that we offer to that group of students. Thanks, Claire and Ashling. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashling. And similarly to Claire, I work in the disability service in Trinity, but I also work um, in the disability service in Marino Institute of Education. So my roles are split role, similar to Claire. I work as an occupational therapist, providing one on one support to students who are registered with the disability services. And then I also work as a disability officer where I meet students um, for what I'm going to talk a little bit about later in the needs assessment and talk about what supports would be useful for students during their time in college. So it's great to meet you all. Thank you, Ashling and Kieran. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kieran. So I am also in the same role as the guys, but I've, I've been there a little bit longer. So I've been in Trinity for about 15, 15 odd years doing that. Um, so I've lots of roles and I'm, I'm delighted to speak to you a little bit today about occupational therapy, which I'll get to a little bit later. But I'm also a lead on a sensory project that we're looking at in within Trinity, just trying to make Trinity a more inclusive campus by creating different sensory environments and different spaces that suit different students' preferences. Um, so that's a really exciting project. And uh, yeah, delighted to meet up. Thanks, Karen. And Etna? Hi, everyone. My name is um, Etna. I am also an occupational therapist and I'm also a disability officer as well. So I do that dual role as well. Um, but an area of interest that I have um, at the moment is, is within the career plan and, um, and the transition into employment um, stage of, of a student journey. So I'll be looking at it. I'll be talking a little bit about that today as well in terms of work placement, um, internship and Erasmus opportunities as well for students. Um, and I look forward to just uh, talking a little bit about that then as well. Thanks, Etna. And Alison? Hi, I'm Alison. Um, I have been working in Trinity uh, with Kieran for the last 15 years, uh, originally as a disability officer doing actually the same kind of work that um, Claire is doing now about pre-entry. But my focus now has narrowed because I'm an educational psychologist, so I support all these students registered with us in terms of their academic skills. Perfect, thanks Alison. So we're going to start in the area of orientation events and resources as attendees 
in this webinar could be just got their place in college or they've been in college a year or two. But this question is uh, for Claire. So as uh, starting university is an exciting time, but this can also be an overwhelming experience for students with disabilities and they might know what college is like and ensure about the disability service and what supports uh, they can provide. What events would you uh, recommend for first year to go to or where to find out more information about a disability service? Uh, they'll just give an overview of orientation events and resources. Thank you, Courtney. Um, and I would definitely echo what you've just mentioned there, that orientation, it's a really exciting time. Uh, but it also can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, there's a lot of new information. There's a lot to get used to. Um, but there is also a lot of resources and there's a lot within the colleges that's there to, to help you to take those first steps and to get yourself set up. So um, I would have a couple of tips to share just to maybe help you to make the most of everything that might be available to you at orientation and to have as positive and as little overwhelming of an experience as possible. Um, probably the first and most important tip that I would have would be to connect with your disability service access office or access officer, depending on uh, what's available within your college. Um, when you receive your course office and you're getting set up, you're getting registered as a student, it can be really, really useful to do a little bit of an online search about the disability or the access support services that are there. Um, it helps you to get to know what you can expect. Um, and it also might help you if you have any questions about how to set up supports. Um, a lot of colleges will have some kind of information about their disability support somewhere on the college website. Um, so it's, it's good to go in and, and be informed and know how you can make that first connection. How do you register for supports and what might you expect? Um, I, would, I would also recommend getting in touch if you do have any queries about the supports that are available. Um, at orientation time, it's a time when most areas of college are there to help. They're, they're there to help to give you information um, tell, to tell you what you need to do as a first year student. So definitely do contact your access officer, contact your disability uh, support service if you, you do need any assistance. Um, you asked about what events uh, I, I would recommend that incoming students attend. Um, and leading on from connecting with your disability support or access support, most of them, particularly those that offer the DARE scheme, will do some kind of an orientation event or programme. And that is to help inform you about the supports and how you can get them set up. So that's a really important one to look out for uh, or to ask about is whether there is some kind of a disability specific orientation event to go along to. I would also recommend making the most of any events really that are that are happening within the college. So um, a, lot, a lot of the time in the first weeks in the orientation and freshers week, you might have a freshers fair where societies will tell you about what they do and give you an opportunity to sign up. Um, your students union might run events to help you get to know what the student union does. Um, many colleges will have student mentorship or buddy schemes, so it's a good way of connecting with other students or connecting with, with your, your classmates. Um, and I'd say even if the events are online or in person, it's still a really good way of getting to know everything and having a chance to get to know others. So do go along without overloading yourself. It's important to you know, go along to as many things as you feel able to, but definitely make the most of the opportunity to go along and, and attend any kind of events that you might be interested in. Um, I would, on that note of things sometimes being a bit overwhelming, I would recommend allowing yourself a little bit of time just to get used to everything. Um, orientation is a time when the, the college really will do a lot to showcase everything that it has to offer and all of the opportunities and then try and share a lot of information with you to help you get set up on your student journey. Um, but 
that can that can also be a lot to take on. So do try and take things one step at a time. Allow yourself time to get used to a new routine, um, to settle into your your class timetable, uh, also to get used to the new environments and the physical environment of the college, but also the online learning environment, which is somewhat new to to most of us. Still, we're still learning about online learning. Um, so it can be good when you're set up and, and you have your timetable, if you have an opportunity to go onto campus uh, or to go to your college and have a look around, familiarize yourself with where your classes might be taking place before classes start um, or even within the first few weeks to just have time to go and wander around so that you're not maybe worried on the first day about finding where you need to go um, or turning up late to a class because you, you can't find the room and, and getting more overwhelmed, take your time to, to find your way around the environment and take your time to familiarize yourself with any of the online learning platforms because there's, there's such a range of them and, and many colleges will use different systems. Um, of course, college is also about academics. So um, as much as it is great in orientation to connect with societies and student union and support services, um, also do think a little bit about your course and the academic uh, demands that are ahead of you. Um, as I mentioned, it can be good to familiarize yourself with whatever learning platform. Um, do go along to your course orientation. That's probably also one of the key things is to go along to any in induction or orientation classes that your course might be having. Um, but also maybe take a little bit of time to familiarize yourself with things like the library. How does your library work? Um, you know, how might you best plan your assignments? Um, and, and some colleges will also have supports and events at orientation that will help you with that to, to look at um, what academic skills you might need to start off with within your first few weeks of college. Um, so I think th those would be probably my main recommendations around orientation and making the most of the resources. Um, if any of my fellow panelists have anything to add, I think Kieran, I see your hand up. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, it was, it's just to say around orientation, there will be, orientations can be overwhelming as Claire is saying, they can be highly enjoyable, but if you miss something, or if for instance now in, in the world we're in, if something's online, you thought it was in person or you, 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 you miss an event, do reach out, reach out to either your department or reach out to disability service and reach out then, because it's it, I suppose we, we see this a lot with students who maybe miss their initial things and then go the whole semester, go the whole year without without actually really connecting with anyone. Um, so really, at that time, if you do miss something, do reach out immediately. Um, but also it's it's the orientation, although it's really good to meet um, meet students and to go to the events. They're going to be great events in, in different different colleges. Um, if, it, if for some reason you can't go to a group event, or you, you don't feel comfortable doing that, still do reach out. You can do your orientation kind of your own way too. Like we would do that individually with students, show them around places, give them the information, connect them with people. So, so please do, I suppose the main aim is just to reach out and connect uh, in whatever way. I see Alison, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, maybe, is this a good time or is it? are we going to talk about it later to talk about um, sort of more personalized support like academic advisors or tutors that they have in some institutions? What do you think? You can jump in and say it, yep. Yeah, do you want to expand on that, Alison, or would you like me to go into it? Oh, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Claire. Okay, okay, great. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably one of the things that I, I, I should have mentioned um, is that, you know, obviously your, your disability your access support is really important to connect with them as early as possible, but they're not, they're often not the only supports that are available in college. So it can also be useful to familiarize yourself with what else is available to you. And um, as Alison has mentioned, one of the things that many colleges offer is a, either a tutor or some kind of academic advisor. So usually this will be a member of the academic staff. And um, so a lecturer, and um, it could be somebody in your course or you know somebody in a, in a different faculty or a different subject area in college um, but they will act as your your go-to person for any academic queries really so if you're not sure about 
you know, things like your timetable or how your modules will work or what to do for exams, where to find timetables. Often an academic advisor or a tutor is a really good person to connect with. And again, echoing what Kieran said, do connect. Um, even if you don't have any questions within your orientation period, it can be a good idea to just reach out to that person and introduce yourself and ask them, what is your role and what can you help me with while I'm here? So that when the time comes, if you do have something that you need assistance with, you'll know who they are, you'll know what to go to them for um, and you know they, they'll already know who you are so I think that's that's definitely a really good tip to add. Thanks Claire. Uh, I think I'll also go back to Harry as a student in Trinity what have you found as a student with disability going to the disability service and just in college in general if you want to uh, give us an overview of your Sure, sure, my experience, yeah. So my experience with disability service was um, I only interacted them with them when I needed them at the start, um, which was, um, as I said before, is when I was facing um, repeat exams. And um, yeah, they've just been like, like it helps a lot, it helps a lot um, interacting with them because, you know, they're, they're kind of experts on this thing. Like, your situation is probably like it is unique in a way but they've probably seen very similar situations year and year and year year in year out you know so they're equipped like they they kind of know what works and what doesn't and they can give you tools and advice on things that work like for me um meeting with Alison and uh, getting study tips from her or um you know meeting with um I met with Declan at the start of the year, who was my disability officer, and he gave me, he told me like what supports I could avail of, like um, laptops and um, doing exams on laptops and extra notes I could get and um, all this stuff. So, yeah, I, I found it very easy to uh, get in touch with the disability service. Um, there was a lot of good supports came from them. And um, yeah, um, and yeah, there's a bunch of other like smaller things like. Like since I have autism as well, there's like a, a drop-in group for autism, and um, you know, so there's a couple of extra things uh, about disability service that like, like other colleges I don't think would have, um, or maybe they do like disability specific things that help a lot, and um, so yeah, and then there's the ability co-op as well, which is because um, I'm, you know, I have a disability and I, I work um, to you know manage that. But I'm also passionate about like student activism, you know, and kind of trying to make the college um, fit, fit my needs better and serve me better. And so there's the ability co-op as well, which I'm involved in, which is there's a lot of student activism on campus for students with disabilities. And I found that very, um, very rewarding. I, and I enjoy the work. And I enjoy who I work with on that. So, yeah, that's been my experience with disability service. Sorry, my uh, connection went there. Uh, so I'm presuming, Harry, did you? Uh, yeah, I just wrapped up your... there, yeah. Okay. And does anybody else have anything to, to add? I, I suppose I'm happy to, to go in, Courtney, to kind of talk about accessing the, the services or the supports in college. Um, Harry has given us good insight of what his experience was. Um, but I suppose Claire's made, made the good point that once you're kind of getting settled in, one of the first things probably to look at is just actually researching or Googling your college's disability service. I suppose depending where you're going to college, there might be one designated person as disability or access officer, or there might be a team of people in a larger service. So just identifying who they are. And if you, if you can't find them or you're not certain where to go, even just asking the, the general college reception or getting in contact with one of your lecturers, somebody will be able to direct you towards them pretty early on. Um, there is no, I suppose, deadline. You don't have to apply to the service or, or meet with the access officer by any certain date but it probably is better to get in touch with them sooner rather than later just so if you do need supports that they're in place for you in good timing and that you get to make the most out of them early on in the first semester. 
So I suppose once you you find out who they are in your college, you can make contact with them and they'll be able to talk through the steps of how to get set up and how to register and they'll be able to provide you with the directions. It'll look a little bit different in every college. Um, one thing that that is quite common, though, is that usually you will need to provide some sort of medical documentation verifying your disability in terms of actually getting set up with the registration. Um, and once that's happened, I, I know someone has popped in a question there about will you be assigned somebody usually you are assigned an officer whether it's an access officer or a disability officer um, and they will reach out to you and, and look to meet with you I suppose the meeting is just a way to get to know each other to talk about your background to talk about what the demands of your course are going to be and to explore what types of supports are available to you in the college and what's going to benefit you going forward. Um, that meeting is sometimes called a needs assessment meeting and I suppose just to, in terms of what to expect it's good to kind of reflect on your previous experiences of maybe some of the challenges you faced but also some things you felt worked well if you have any personal strategies or if you had used supports previously previously in secondary school or, or a previous college course you might have done. It's a good idea to have those things kind of thought through in advance, um, but your disability or access officer will be able to explore that more in depth with you. Um, I suppose one of the things you could probably expect to talk to the officer about is whether or not you'd like to disclose your disability to the school or to your department and the staff members there. Um, I suppose the benefit of the main reason of doing that would be in order to receive supports from the college um, which are sometimes called reasonable accommodations. Uh, Harry gave a bit of a, an oversight of some of his reasonable accommodations um, and what that looks like it could be exam accommodations so maybe having extra time in your exams, it could involve using assistive technology in your lecture so maybe using a, a type of recording device um, to help you take your notes and maybe you might apply to receive your handouts in advance. Those would be some of the, the typical supports you might, might receive. Um, so, so that's kind of an overview of how to actually access the service. But I think as, as Claire said, researching in advance, just so you know who to contact and what types of supports they would have available. Um, and I think Kieran's made a really good point earlier as well about you know, not being afraid to reach out if you haven't gotten around to doing this and setting yourself up with the service in the first couple of weeks, like there is no need to worry, but it is important that you do reach out and, and you don't just kind of put it off for down the line. Um, I don't know, does anyone else have anything to add for kind of the actual practical piece of accessing the supports? I think that was that's kind of the general the general information about it. Thanks, Ashling. We'll, we'll uh, go in to talk about uh, occupational therapy, which is one of the supports that will be available for your disability service. So I questioned Kieran that uh, sometimes it's uh, not very clear what occupational therapy is and what it could how it can support students with disabilities that it's not just to do occupation. So how useful can occupational therapy be for a student with disability and um, how can they access the support? It's, it's always the, the million dollar question, what is, what is occupational therapy? And, and the reason it is, is because it's a really broad uh, profession. People may, may see it in lots of different ways. For instance, occupational therapists work with kids around movement and hand writing in certain instances, or may work home adaptions uh, with, with people around with, with a physical disability. Um, but I suppose our, our role specifically, so occupational therapy is all about occupation. And occupation, when we talk about it, is anything that you do, anything that occupies you. Uh, so rather than it being a job necessarily, it's just literally anything that's part of life. So that can be doing exams, joining societies, cooking your dinner, cleaning up your, your apartment, anything. It can be absolutely anything that you you feel you need to, you want or you know, need to do within your life. That's where we place our focus in working with you. It's trying to figure out how to do these things. Um, I suppose the reason we do it is one, it helps with college and helps with with learning life skills and getting through life. But also we would see that it's really connected to health. That the better you're able to do the things that make up your daily life, the healthier, the more health and well-being you have. 
It's because you feel you are connected. You are able to get lots of great things out of the things you do. So for instance, joining society will give you huge enjoyment, connection to other students, um, a passion for something that you're interested in. So obviously we want to help you get in and engage in that. So that's where we place our focus. So opposed, as opposed to perhaps other kind of supports such as a counseling or medical approaches, we place a lot of the huge focus upon what you do and how you do it. Um, I suppose to give an idea of some of the key aspects uh, behind sort of occupational therapy and things that inform the way you work. Um, sometimes it's, it's done, delivered as a group, uh, and that can be a hugely beneficial thing and students can learn off each other and how they manage. But I'd say in most of the universities uh, and colleges, um, it's largely done one-to-one. -one. Um, and you'll find that it's, it's in more and more universities and colleges across Ireland. Uh, I think it's now, it's probably about 10 or 11 uh, institutions that have occupational therapy in it. And that one-to-one -one is, is that it's really, really highly, as a professional, really highly collaborative in how we work with students. Uh, it's a really positive thing, because and it's something that I love, I say, and I've done this for 15 years, I still love what I do, is because when students come in, they bring so much with them, so much ability, so many ways that they manage life uh, up till now. And I love being able to work, work with students. And then as, as Harry has said, we do have an expertise in college and college life and college role. And when you can bring those two things together, that us being the experts, I suppose, within college and the student being the expert in how they live their life and how they've managed so far, that can be a really good fit. Um, it's really individually tailored. And I think that's really important because everyone is so different. Uh, they're also doing completely different courses uh, across college and they go about doing things in, in often very different ways. Uh, and have different situations. So it's really individually tailored to, to whatever way uh, a student uh, wants to work uh, and what they want to work upon. The other bit, I suppose, to, to highlight with occupational therapy as opposed to other supports is, is we focus, the model we use, and a lot of OTs will, will focus on this, is the person, environment, and occupation. So we look at sort of all three sides. We look at you as a person, your kind of skills, the areas you, you do well, the areas you want to improve in. We look at your occupation, so the things you need to do in your course. So do you have placement? Do you have lab work? Do you have small group work, lectures? But then also we place a big focus on the environment uh, of college. And that's where I suppose the occupational therapist being within college is, is fantastic because we have a really good understanding of the physical environment. So in terms of you finding good places to study, good places to spend time between lectures, good places to get food if, that you like, um, but also, the, the social environment and the college environment, how easy is your course to contact? How easy do you find it to contact them? How easy is it to, to, to join up with your class and to meet new, new, new people? For instance, a, a class of 30 people, very different to going into science and there's, there's 300 people in it. So how you go about joining and connecting with people? Um, I suppose, think of just OT and higher education, what perhaps to expect? And it, it actually echoes a lot, and I suppose we are all occupational therapists, a lot of us that have spoken already, um, I expect us to ask about all aspects of life. It's not just about academics, not just about um, your academic skills and your ability to get to your course. It's about how you're managing in accommodation. It's about how you're managing at home, how you're balancing part-time work, how you're enjoying societies, uh, how you're sleeping, how you're eating, anything at all. So we'd ask about all of this, because all of this is, is important. Um, to you in, in college. Expect us to want you to work with us. Uh, that is, we're, not, we're not putting it all back on you to come up with the ideas, but we really do want to work with people. Uh, and that's a core bit of occupational therapy is, is that collaboration. And there may be some specific assessments or, or, or questionnaires that we use, but it's, it's kind of important that a lot of the assessments and things that we, we, we get students to complete aren't about uh, a diagnosis or aren't about uh, um, I suppose identify necessarily um, uh, kind of a, a disability focus. It's really functional. So we've we've got something called, for instance, the, the Trinity Student Profile, and that just helps students to understand what they would like to work on. It's a bit of an extension, I suppose, as Ashley has said, of the needs assessment, because perhaps when you start college, you don't know what would be good to work on. So this is just something that helps you to figure out. You know what? Actually, organizing my time is what I need, or getting started essays earlier in the term or actually my sleep cycle is all over the place. So it helps you to, to, to identify those things. I think in a lot of colleges, it's probably the same, but certainly in Trinity, we also like it to be really flexible. And when I, when I, when I made that point about missing an orientation event, the same thing goes for missing a, a, a meeting with either a disability officer in general or with, with an OT. 
it's that's that's part of it you can't you have so many things to be doing in your life this is supposed to be a support so if you do miss it that's no problem just come back and get in touch again um i suppose just to, just to finish i just thought it would be but just a couple of examples of things we've I've, over the years I've worked on. It's a lot of, I suppose, at college because it's a new routine. It's a new sort of uh, self-directed nature and how you organize yourself. We do a lot of finding routines and it's not necessarily always a really strict, rigid timetable. Sometimes that works for people, but for a lot of people, it's about just finding a rhythm and a passion to how you go about doing college and getting to what you need to do. And then per perhaps do you prefer studying in the morning, do you prefer studying in the evening? Do you have a lot of society events in the afternoon or evening? What, what's the rhythm of your student life and how you can make that work? Medication and how, how you manage medication within college can be a big element as well. Um, and perhaps you're, you're, you're changing over from, from services or we have a lot of international students coming to Trinity who perhaps are, are moving into new services and, and are trying to sort out medication as being one part of, of how they manage and how they, how they manage that within a, a different routine. Like it may be a, you made lectures at five, six in the evening, or you may be looking to study later at night and how you go about doing that and how you manage um, taking medication and even, even getting access to medication and connection supports around that can be, a, can, be, can be an issue for students. So even connecting with us around that. I know that's a little outside of occupational therapy, but it is something that comes up a lot. And um, I suppose a lot other thing is then the environment. Finding good spaces that work for you. Uh, good library spaces, um, good spaces within lectures, uh, and then the connection to too. And I suppose this is something we want. We want. We, we keep saying it's great to connect to the disability service and great to connect with us. And we want that. But our main aim is that you connect to your course and to the others in college. That's what we're here to support you doing. It's not necessarily that we want you to come back to us for four years. It's fine if you do. But the main thing is we're there to help you connect with 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 the others around you, your lecturers and your the students there. Um, so that's a bit of a whistle stop tour of, of occupational therapy. Hopefully that's clear. I don't know if any, anyone else has anything to say on that. I think that was very, very comprehensive, Kieran. I think just the, going back on the a point you already made in terms of flexibility is something that I definitely hold as high importance when I'm meeting with students for occupational therapy in that they're not tied to a certain number of meetings and that it, it can be very flexible and it's important for the student you know themselves to determine okay I'd like you know this many maybe focus sessions or if they're not sure maybe to have a more prolonged engagement but that there is no set number of meetings that it, that it, it can be very flexible and led by the student themselves as well. Yeah absolutely. I was just going to say the same thing, Ashling, that about the, the flexibility piece, and particularly, you know, you can you can meet with an occupational therapist either for a specific purpose. So if it's just to help you get set up through the orientation period and, and find your feet in college, if it's because you're starting on a placement and you're not really sure how you might balance a placement with maybe some uh, some academic work or just your lifestyle outside of academics. Um, or for some students, you know, they may meet with an occupational therapist regularly throughout their studies where they have a check in and they kind of get that, that constant support around, um, you know, continuing on as a student and progressing through your course. So uh, as Kieran has, has already said, it's, it's very much about, you know, what the student wants to focus on and how you want to work. And, and we're very flexible to that. So. That would just be the only thing that I would add. Thanks, Claire. So my next question is for Alison. So in for a student's time in college, they may need to avail of academic and learning technology supports. Uh, Alison, if you could tell us a bit more about these supports. OK, well, to take to start with the, the broad, really, um, irrespective of what college or university you are going to be attending, they uh, provide support and tuition and academic skills to the entire student body. So, for example, in Trinity, it would be called student learning development, uh, but other in colleges and universities, they might have a different title. But their job is to ensure that all students in the college 
uh, acquire the skills that they need as they transition from uh, second level education to third level. So my first piece of advice would be to seek out support from student learning whose job it is really and whose expertise is in making sure that you acquire those skills. And thereafter, if you're still having difficulty and perhaps I would suggest that you wait until you've submitted a few pieces of work and you've received some feedback on that work and you still can't figure out exactly what it is that the what academic staff are wanting from you, that's generally a good time to go back to the disability service and ask if there's any academic support available or learning support as it's known in some colleges. So um, for me, I work really closely with the occupational therapists. Um, the academic support service is bespoke. It's unique to the challenges that are experienced by individual students. And it might encompass uh, anything from helping you to figure out your timetable and managing your modules in Blackboard. Blackboard is our online virtual learning environment. In some colleges, they might have something called Moodle or something called Canvas. Uh, it might be learning how to write in an academic tone, how to reference. Uh, but I do an awful lot of work with students who are in their final year with their final year projects or their thesis and their dissertation, because that can be quite complicated. Um, so I suppose the sooner you reach out and become adept at managing the academic side of work, the, the easier you're going to find college. So uh, don't be afraid to approach your disability officer and ask how you can access that support. Thank you, Alison. And does anybody have anything to add with that? No? Just to, just to echo what Alison said, that we it, it, it's we work very closely with academic support that sometimes in some colleges occupational therapists who work in those academic skills we're very fortunate to have somebody like Alison there that we we would work sort of, I suppose on a broader focus around student life and then specific academic skills uh, and I, I just think that's just an example of as you, as you go through college and as as you you see different supports you may see that different ones are better for different things and it's about you kind of starting to go you know what that's the one that works for me with that this is what i need at the moment it doesn't mean you have to engage with all supports at all times mm. it, it's for you to choose at different times different students so i've had students who come to me for, for a lot of meetings to start and then go to allison for for as, as she says towards the the end of college doing dissertations um so it is about students kind of taking that on themselves feeling, feeling empowered to do that that you can pick and choose what you want to use and actually, I forgot to mention uh, assistive technology. So if you've been used to using uh, technology in school, we can talk about ways in which you continue using that. But also, if you have not used uh, technologies before, for example, um, voice dictation, um, note taking technology, special software for proofreading and editing, um, there's a whole suite of actually free resources available to you and we're very happy to show those to you and help you to acquire those skills and train you in. So that's part of our function as well. Thanks Alison. Uh, I'm just going to jump in and talk about uh, club societies and student activities. So even though it's very important to have a handle on your academic work keep up to date with classes, um, get your support sorted and disability service is also really important to engage in the activities, the social activities in college, because getting involved in clubs and societies, you can learn uh, a variety of different skills that you wouldn't say learn on your course. So if you were in a society and you were the chairperson, you're going to learn a lot of project management skills, communication, teamwork, and these are all uh, transferable skills, especially when you leave to not really any college <laughs> and then go into the world of work. So it's um, definitely something to consider. And I know that it can be quite daunting putting yourself out there to get involved or you don't know what you'd be interested in. Um, you might even try and just take a small step of um, going to a society event or then progressing to uh, running for class rep. So this is definitely something that you should consider. And I definitely would say that I mean, if you went to 
your disability service or your disability officer and ask for advice on how to run for the class rep or how to get involved in society, they'd be more than happy to uh, guide you in the right direction. Um, I also want to just talk a little bit about what we have in Trinity. So we have um, a student group called the Trinity Ability Co-op. So that is cooperative of students with disabilities working towards radical inclusion. So we weren't a set uh, society, but we came out of the fact that sometimes colleges aren't as inclusive to students with disabilities as we would like to. And it's uh, it has just been a great year. Um, we've only been uh, a movement uh, for a year now, and it's definitely something to consider if you know you're in your college and you know other students with disabilities it's a great way to make new friends and you know you don't have to be restricted in the clubs and societies that might be in your university you can always make your own group and I definitely would encourage that um it's uh you'll be able to um create positive change in your college as well so it's definitely uh, worth considering and yeah that's that's my uh, piece on clubs and societies so as I said it'll be different for every university but um, it's definitely something to consider and I'm just going to then have a, the last question for Etna so in university uh, students might engage in work placements work placements Erasmus and internships this can be a good way of engaging with life outside of university uh, could you give a bit of an overview of these transition points and the supports that will be available for students with disabilities? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Courtney. Um, and I suppose it's, it's good that you, you just kind of recently spoke about obviously getting involved in, in extracurricular kind of activity and um, volunteer work and things like that and learn how to develop as a student during your time in, in college. I think it's it's ideal now that I'm talking about obviously placement situations and, uh, and work placements and internships. Because they are really great opportunities, I think, for students to develop as uh, to develop and, and think about their career path as well and life post college. Um, so just to, to talk about placement and internships, um, uh, firstly, quite a large number of you would will probably be engaging in a course where a placement or an internship might be a, requir a requirement or um, a module as part of, of that course um, uh, where it is relevant obviously to, to your degree as well, particularly within the professional courses. So typically th this would really include the, the health, the health science courses, um, uh, also education related courses, um, but we're also seeing kind of placements and internships now crop up in, in the likes of tech and, um, and other professional courses as well to include law. Um, so those work placements and internships, they, they can very much range from either one month to nine months to even a year um, and they, get, they can be mandatory, they can be a requirement, or they can also be an elective um, module as part of, of a person's course as well, uh, for possibly for additional accreditation as well. Um, so firstly, like it's, it's a great way to gain uh, first-hand experience what it's like to be engaged in a, in a, in a work placement and in a working environment. Um, and it's also a really good, um, a good chance to get to develop um, personal and interpersonal skills as well. One thing that Kieran has mentioned there as well is about um, helping students during placement as well to help them manage balance between academics, between um, between actually the, the work placements itself. And then the likes of Alison could support even with managing thesis for final year students who are also doing their placement. And often that can be, become quite overwhelming for a lot of students. So we've got quite a quite a number of different supports that are available then for students who are going through that as well, um, to include occupational therapy and academic support and even assistive technology as well um, for, for students who might even want, want to apply assistive technology to their, to their work placement through the likes of software and things like that, that they can bring in as a reasonable accommodation. Um, so one of the things that, that Ashton has mentioned as well is about having a meeting with, um, with your disability officer to just discuss various different supports. That also extends to placement and internship as well. Um, so if students wish to forward some supports um, that they may have used in a classroom setting or um, perhaps in an exam uh, setting as well, they can carry some of those supports with them as well to a, um, a placement setting or workplace setting or internship setting. 
Um, now they vary, they, they may vary and they may differ to those um, typical supports that they may avail of within a classroom setting. Um, but it's really important to have that discussion with the disability officer to identify the barriers that you might encounter when it comes to a workplace setting and then begin to identify what kind of supports you might need to avail of. Um, and the, the, the college itself, they're, they're legally obliged to carry out these supports as well. So it's important to be aware of that, that these are definitely things that can be brought into the workplace. And, it's, and, and we, we do encourage to have that discussion with either their placement coordinator initially, if they wish, um, and then if they wish to, to have that further discussion then with their disability officer, we can put those formal supports in as well. Um, and we can even support students with how they might disclose that in a workplace setting or in, in an internship setting as well. Um, so they can range from things like, as mentioned, assistive technology, if they want to bring in uh, software, perhaps to um, a laptop or a computer within the within the um, workplace setting. Um, or for say, for example, an, a nurse might uh, require a uh, rest breaks throughout the day for, for any given reason. Um, so just typical kind of uh, accommodations that we would be able to apply in those particular settings as well. But again, they're going to differ um, depending on the workplace setting, depending on the internship as well. Um, as I mentioned there as well, just in terms of occupational therapy and balance as well, um, it's a service that is available um, within Trinity, for example. Um, OTs often meet with students who are on placements and engage in internships to help manage that balance, to help manage workload, um, to help manage uh, roles outside of the placement setting as well. So often people might be, uh, they might have a, a caring role or they might um, be engaging in further academics and that often is a requirement as well that you have other different um, assessments and deadlines that are going on at the same time as placement and internships as well. Um, and that can be quite overwhelming for a lot of students. So an occupational therapist is there as well to, to help support students through that, those various different roles that they might, might have. And I know there's someone who mentioned as well in just in the question form there as well, um, and, and, and obviously uh, dealing with the impacts of a disability, um, but also how that might impact you while you're on placement and, and uh, engage in an internship as well. So they're all different things that we will be able to support you through the likes of occupational therapy. Um, Alison Doyle as well can help in terms of find your, uh, we often get a lot of students coming in to, uh, who are struggling to manage their dissertation alongside a workplace uh, placement or internship as well and that can, can become very very overwhelming as well so we have the likes of Alison who'll be able to support students through that as well um, when it comes to the dissertation management. Um, one thing I would encourage and I think we've, we've all kind of echoed, echoed it here tonight as well is just reaching out and making sure that you are connecting with the um, the right members of staff as well. I think initially if we and I think it has been mentioned here as well about identifying the role of each person within a workplace setting um, identifying your uh, who your placement coordinator is is and what kind of support they can provide to you, um, and then having that discussion as well with your disability officer, and seeing what kind of role they can play then in, in, in facilitating supports within a placement setting as well. Um, so initially having that meeting and discussing that with them, and ideally not at a time when it may be very very late in the placement or very very late in the internship, identifying the concern initially as it happens, and then having that discussion with um, whoever you, you feel would be fit or whoever you've identified can support you in that in that sense as well. One bit of advice I would give during um, work placements and during internships is to connect with your colleagues um, and to, to, to develop your community, whether it is you might be naturally doing that through networking that will help in terms of career prospects further on down the line. But every colleague will become that uh, an additional support for you. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis within the work placement or within your internship as well. And that can be, they can be really essential members when it comes to the day, at the end of the day, when you need a little bit of support. And if your placement coordinator isn't available or perhaps your supervisor isn't, isn't available on that day, your colleague most likely has been through similar issues before and will be able to provide you with that one-to-one -one support as well. So do connect with them and, and develop your, your networking community in that, in that sense as well. And as I said, that will really help further on down the line when you're possibly looking for a job yourself and you have five or six different members from different teams available to support you um, with various different applications and things like that as well. Um, one thing I just want to mention as well in terms of um, Erasmus. Um, so uh, Erasmus, there's there's a couple of different forms of Erasmus. You have your, your typical kind of classic study abroad um, placement that a lot of students might engage in um, uh, throughout their time in, in Trinity as well. Um, and they that's typically uh, you'd be you'd be going to another country or you'd be trying 
staff and abroad um, to engage and, and complete modules um, within a, 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 linking, a, a, a linked um, university. Um, so that, uh, that can obviously bring about several different challenges for, for students with disabilities as well, and they may need to connect in with the disability service within that host university. Um, so one thing, again, that we will be able to support you with as a disability officer while you are applying for Erasmus um, position as well uh, is to help you get set up within that host university, help you contact that host university, identify what kind of supports are available within that host university and um, identify what kind of supports then you can carry from your Trinity experience over to that host university then as well and see what is available to you. Um, but also early on in terms of preparation, how you can identify what university will be best for you to to link in with for for that um, for that year or for that period abroad. Um, in terms of things like preparing for travel um, and preparing for uh, pre preparing for living and and engaging in, in, in a different country and in, engaging in a different culture altogether, um, an occupational therapist can also support you with that transition. Um, and help you get prepared with that with that um, uh, that transition as well. Um, one thing I would say as well in terms of placements um, and work placements abroad, that's also a thing that, that, that can fall under Erasmus as well. So there's, there's various different forms of Erasmus. So I mentioned the study abroad. Um, so that's your kind of classic Erasmus uh, program. But you all, there, there can also be work placements and, and traineeships or, or research projects that students can engage in during their studies as well that are offered in various different courses. Um, I would take advantage of, if you can, um, of any opportunity that does arise within your given course um, that will allow you to travel abroad because it is similar to, to work placement internship. Fantastic uh, experience to, to have to, to be able to develop those, those skills and to really integrate into a different culture and different country altogether. So do de definitely take advantage of that. And you can do that in other formats as well, like volunteer work abroad. And there's plenty of different societies that offer that in, in college as well. And Courtney... Um, Courtney has spoken a little bit about that already, but do really indulge in that in that um, uh, life, that part of college life as well, um, because it's, you can develop on so many different skills in that area. Um, that's all I can really think of, unless any of the other panelists there have anything else to add in terms of placement, internship, or harassment support. Sorry, Kieran, I think yeah. you have up there. Yeah, it, it's just, it, I suppose it's just a co that college and like place to Erasmus, everything that's there, it's, it's all wonderful opportunities. And and like, I know we're all talking about supports and you, and you may need supports, but it, it, that's the main aim of all of this is just to help you get those those bits of engagement. Like so many students come back from Erasmus with such, such brilliant experiences. So many students work part-time while being in college and that's a hugely supportive thing. It's a great thing for them to do within college. So it is just, and that's what I, so I suppose just to come back to the individualized bit, all of these colleges full of such amazing opportunity and it's a really enjoyable time, but just maybe at different times over the course of it, you may need some help. But, but largely I would say the college is, is there are so many different aspects to it that you can pretty much find something for, everyone can find something for themselves in it. I will say as well, where it's maybe not offered in the course to go out and seek that information. Like there's so many different opportunities within college that you can, um, avail of that if you do seek those opportunities as well it may not be part of the course that you have and you're lucky enough to have an abroad placement or a work placement opportunity um, or an internship but they, these are different things that you can do possibly in your spare time during the summer uh, a lot of students will be very very busy and may not have a huge amount of spare time but during those summer months it's, it's, a, it's an ideal time to really to really get to know what it's like to actually work in a working environment as well um, and to use those months to, to, to your advantage to, to seek those opportunities. I think that's uh, wrap, wrapping up our discussion. If you're Zoom moving on to the question and answers. Um, well, I, I'll just uh, read it. Some questions have already been answered. Okay. So just, just um, okay, well, I'll Okay, Ken, do you have your hand up? Oh, uh, just um, I know we've been talking about there, and you know, I honestly want to say, you know, I I started this role four and a half years ago, and one of the first things I did was drop down to Trinity and talk to the disability office, and I've been super impressed with the work that the, the disability office has done, and um, 
but obviously just you know um harry's here and he has to head off very shortly so um maybe harry you could just give you know maybe, there's no one listening it's just you and me what's your honest appraisal of getting through college with autism or whatever condition that you have um i suppose it's actually a lot easier um than i thought in a way like when i first came in i thought it'd be easy and then I um I really struggled and then I thought it was super hard and now I'm actually it's, it's a bit of a breeze to be honest um because it's just it's, you, you just kind of have to figure it out you know like I could tell you how I figured it out from my course you know but it's going to be different for every single course you know some courses have more exams some courses more assignments so you kind of just have to figure it out um getting through college and in terms of managing my disability again you kind of have to figure it out um, like with me certain things help you know like um you know maybe a check-in um with a counselor helps maybe once a month um i can tell you go on about different things that work for me to you know for like self-management and productivity and that kind of thing it's going to be different for everyone um but yeah just spending time at it and trying to figure it out trying to figure out how to manage my course and how to manage my own time and my own productivity um, and eventually, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and you will figure it out and um, it'll be easy once you do. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Alison? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I suppose, ensure that people understand that Yes, you might register with us in first year with any disability service in first year, and then you might not need to see anybody. And then you might get to third and fourth year and think, oh, hang on a minute, I really need some help now. And it would be very sad if you felt that you couldn't contact us because, oh, well, I haven't spoken to them since first year. It doesn't matter. You just reach out at any time, even if you're, you're in your final year. That's what we're here for. That's our job. And we're always really happy to help any student. And it's really important for you to know that we actually enjoy our job. We enjoy being here and we enjoy being helpful. So please do get in touch with us. Uh, thank you, Alison. I'm just seeing from the questions, some of them have been answered by Harry for some of them, but um, I might read one out and see if anybody else's feedback on it so one of the questions is is there anything that may be helpful to do which would make transition of moving to a new city or student accommodation easier I don't know if this seems like a good question for an occupational therapist maybe um I might ask Edna what do you think Plus my mom from even Erasmus and moving to a new country and different things like that, just trying to integrate and identify first what support, what supports are available, what community is available, um, or supportive community that is available to the student first. Um, and then seeking like, friendship opportunities, obviously getting to get involved in societies. Um, I suppose it, it you have to kind of push your, put yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit there. Um, it's initially going to be difficult and it's, it's that transition period will take a little bit of additional time. But once you do find that community, that supportive community, um, like even linking in with the occupational therapists and seeking various different opportunities of how you might seek friendships, say, for example, within that city, um, will be a good place to start. And then hopefully, naturally, there's going to be a lot more other people who are, who are in a, the exact same position as yourself, um, who are going through the same kind of transition difficulties as well. Um, so just even just to have that discussion and and throw yourself into the likes of the clubs and societies where everyone is there for the same reason to get to know other people. Just to, to further on that point as well, it, it's something I've seen. I think most colleges have students unions um, and it is something I've seen, like generally if they have social media, put up posters around the place like how to adjust to life in Dublin for example and they might have suggestions of cheap places to eat and just those kind of practical things as an initial bit of guidance so it might be good to check what the, the student union is offering in terms of that uh, advice and if there's anything on the social media channels just maybe to prepare before you move as well. And Kieran? I suppose just thinking about accommodation there that sometimes like I, I worked uh, last year working in 
Trinity Hall, which is the, the first year um, based at student accommodation for a lot of them. Um, and sometimes accommodation, sometimes you connect with people that you live with, sometimes not. Sometimes that's okay. Sometimes you make friends with people in adjoining rooms. Uh, sometimes it's through societies, but I also think it's not to think of societies as as a as a big thing or a big social occasion or anything. There's whole different levels of it from ones that are very much focused upon big groups and speaking in front of people and getting to know people to real doing, really activity based ones. Uh, so I, I think the societies largely the integration to new places be drawn by by what you're interested in, what you love to do. And that'll guide you. Then you get interest and you find people that are of similar, similar interests. Become friendly with people they live with, but, but a lot of people don't as well. So it's just not to put huge pressure on, on student accommodation and that working. It, you, you get to people, meet people in all sorts of different ways. Yeah, I would just like to add to that point. Um, so I was a student uh, not so long ago, um, but even just in first year, like coming from Cavan to Dublin, I didn't know anybody else um, going to Trinity. And I just felt like the main thing was just be open to get to know everyone, you know, and don't uh, judge or write someone off right away. I think that's a really good, like, even if it's, you feel like you or ask somebody that you're in a, in, um, in a class with for a cup of coffee, again, doing something that you might, and it might be a bit out of your comfort zone, but it, it definitely um, is good for your building your confidence and then getting to know just a lot more people. And um, that's what I would recommend doing, but it's the same. Uh, Karen, do you have your hand up again or? Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um yeah so i think that answers that and then harry answered that in the text if you've seen that it was uh joining your local ga soccer rugby club sign up for tidy towns or in society really good suggestions there uh friend groups don't build themselves although it seems that way when you've lived somewhere for 15 20 years um definitely uh you won't make your you might make your friends for life in first year, but like don't put that much pressure on yourself. Like everybody's on the same boat. So just take out the pace that suits you. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to um, see if there's any more questions. Um, yeah, there was a question. Can you have your hand up? Sorry, no, if you had a question, no, just a, this is a, a question that has been in my back of my mind since we would have began. And, um, you know, as I said, you know, there the last time, you know, I think you guys are amazing and you're doing great work. And, and Alison probably can tell you this. Um, anytime I have a question about the education system in Ireland, the first person I send it to is Alison. Um, and she, she replies and gives me the answer. So it's great. So I know and appreciate the work that you're doing, but you know, students also deal with academic staff. They deal with reception staff. So what other supports and training is brought, you know, do people in Trinity, you know, be it lecturers, whatever happens to be, get to help and support people um, who have disabilities or neurodivergent conditions? So you get a, a full campus support. Um, I just wanted, wanted to say that, um, so for in terms of like, say, uh, providing lecture, I'm just giving an overview of how to um, look at a uh, student's uh, learning education needs and and whatever questions they had uh, to best support students because um, at the end of the day, you know, you're not going to know every single thing about how to best support students. But I think the main service is that we're very open and we always say to ask DS to always send us an email if they uh, have any questions on, they're not sure how to best support a student. So that's uh, that's the training that I would say does anybody else have anything? Claire? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned there, Courtney, that the service would meet with schools so every year um, each of us will go out and, and meet with each course and we'll bring feedback from students and we'll discuss how reasonable accommodations are used in the department and how they're actually acting on 
the requests for accommodation that we, we sent through on behalf of students. Um, so that's always a really important time for us to be able to engage with academic staff and to uh, share advice and recommendations. We also have developed a lot of resources for academic staff. So uh, specifically within Trinity on, on our website, we have a section of information that is targeted at academic staff and advising them on inclusive teaching methods, inclusive assessment methods. Um, so there, there's a lot of information and advice they can seek there. Um, I would also mention the, the Trinity Ability Co-op, which is a group of students. Uh, Courtney, you probably mentioned them at the beginning there. Um, or I think Harry mentioned them. Um, these are students who are campaigning uh, and working towards improving accessibility and inclusion uh, within the college. So one of the projects that they worked on was gathering student feedback Back and creating a video with feedback to share with academic staff um, and that was when the transition to online learning happened so it was after the first few months of uh, online learning it was great for the academic staff to receive feedback from students with disabilities about how they were finding the experience and I think that the response to it was really really positive and they took a lot on board and, and you know adapted to, to better suit the needs that they were hearing about. Um, and then there's also the, the Trinity Inclusive Curriculum Project, which um, Alison, I believe you're probably a little bit better linked in to than I am. So <laughs> you wouldn't mind explaining that one. Yeah, the Inclusive Curriculum Project, uh, they're tasked with, and that's a, a group of academic staff, and they're tasked with um, promoting inclusion across all aspects of a college, but particularly in terms of, um, delivering the curriculum in terms of materials and the way in which people teach. And one of the ways of onboarding that is to um, get students, um, sorry, staff to participate in a universal design for learning uh, badge. So there was quite a large group of academic staff who took that badge last year. And as part of that, they have to develop inclusive resources that are pertinent to their course. So that's just is one of a, a number of projects that's ongoing to, I suppose, increase awareness and understanding. Uh, Kieran. Ramesh. Sorry, well, just, um, I suppose the, the only thing I'd, I'd say around in terms of creating, um, I suppose, a better environment overall for students, there's a lot of broad uh, projects going there. To, to, uh, to I suppose wide scale but also same as same as I suppose working with students it's important to still work at the individual level and that goes for staff as well so sometimes there is that students feel really supported and that we sometimes have to to work to, to build a bridge between staff and students to figure out what works for that student and especially in ways like like Alison talked about dissertations there that could be a key one is that the sort of helping supervisors and students who are going to be working together for five six months on something to find a way that works between them can be can be essential. So I suppose that that element there is the, the broad the broad sense of what works, uh, kind of training and, and different things that go on, inclusive curriculum, absolutely. But still at that individual level, that that sort of bridge is important there. And it, it be ourselves, but also as college tutors or various different commensurate roles and different institutions to be that kind of bridge. But I have to say overall, um, academic staff do want to help students. They really do want to work with students. And although sometimes uh, and I've, I've had this so much and, and, and during uh, online, uh, I suppose last year where the disconnection was there, sometimes it came across that the lecturers were being really short with the response. But then when I actually got talking to the lecturer, they had 80 emails following that lecture that they were trying to deal with. So they're trying to, they're trying to respond to all 80 students. So they're sending short ones to everyone. Uh, but students got, took that as being the lecturer didn't want to talk to them. So I think that that bit can be, so I suppose it's important and to say that everybody disability staff or st support staff or academic staff is perfect by any means absolutely not but uh, i would say the vast majority really do want to connect and and help students mm. uh Edna? sorry no um i was also going to say that that, that extends also to the other support um, services that are available within colleges as well like to include like the career service or the tutor service as well like our training doesn't just extend to just the academic staff it's our connections through the support services the other support services in college as well that can play a huge part 
in, in how, a, how a student is supported. So we are trying to bridge that gap almost. So students don't feel as isolated when they are in support with us, say, for, for example, with work placements or Erasmus or something along those lines. If we think that a student needs connection for the connection with the career service to help plan their, their future career path as well, we will help them with that connection as well. Um, and often we have already connected with the with the services to ensure that they have um, they have the, the, the training in place or the information in place or the resources already available um, to support these students who are coming directly from the disability service as well. Um, so, for example, we have a member of staff within the career service who is dedicated to supporting students who are registered with the disability service with planning their career. We have an employability ward. Um, now we're going to be dedicated this semester as well for, for students with disabilities as well to support them with their career pathway. And that's come purely from our connection with the, the career service and other services within, within the college as well. Um, so, so we're hoping that, that, that we don't, we're, we're less, we're, we're a community and we're, we're connected all together so that students don't feel that, that, that kind of isolation when they're seeking separate different services within the, the college as well. And, and, and I hope that that's, that's similar in other um, higher education as well across Ireland. Thanks, Edna and Trisha. I just I have just read one question. I'm sure there's a lot of the the the, um, the um, attendees here are parents. What do you do um, to try and get your get, to get your daughter or your son to reach out to these services when they really don't want to? So this is great for this for the students who are willing to engage. But what do you do about the, the, those students that won't are, are reluctant to reach out for those services? How do you persuade them that this is a positive and a good thing? Karen. It's, it, it can be a tough one because yes, we, we, we generally won't look to engage with, with, with parents directly. We do certainly in the initial stages, we would really, and if, if it's something a student is open to, we, we're happy to meet um, with parents and students. That can be an important part of a transition to college, but, but we do look to really foster that uh, relationship with students directly. And certainly students are always reassured that we don't communicate with, with, with family members outside of, um, outside of their, their consent. From parents' point of view, though, what I would say is, to, and coming, and it's fantastic that you're coming to an event like this, and it's to, to get more and more information about what the services are, and to be able to understand them, and to be able to, to even, uh, even, even look at the website, like all of our names are up on our website, or even to go to, to connect with a name, and with even with, with a son or, son or daughter's consent to say, can I contact this person to even just find out something about it, and then to go back that so-and-so is, is, is expecting your call. We even try to bridge it in some way rather than necessarily going in and saying everything that is happening uh, for the student and taking kind of the, the, the ownership of the power away from the student is to go, I've spoken to, to Kieran. Kieran, Kieran is, is very happy to talk about this and I think he's somebody that could help you. So I think you can still build the bridges without uh, stepping over. Uh, and, 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 and when I say stepping over, obviously I, I absolutely can absolutely understand where parents are coming from in the situation. I really, really can. Um, and it can, also, if you, if you want to get more information, if you, if you don't pick up all the information, we will engage with parents and we will engage with people in a general sense too. I think Kieran might be frozen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe while he we wait for him to come back, Alison. There. Yeah, I just thought it might be useful for, you know, any parents who are attending this evening to know that although it might not seem like it, we are actually contacting students all of the time. Either we're sending out general information on a regular basis, just reminding students of all the supports, but we also send out individual communication to students. So, for example, last semester, I would have sent an email to uh, students I was working with individually and I had embedded a video in that email saying hi it's Alison just reminding you that exams are coming up and you can come and see me so our communication ranges from you know general information sources to really personalized stuff so maybe from a parent perspective maybe you could ask your student hey have you got an email recently from anybody in the disability service or do they send out information or did anybody contact you or what's going on in the disability service and maybe that might prompt them to take a look at some of the stuff that they've been sent 
Uh, Kieran, it's I don't know if you remember yeah, the last I'm, thing. Yeah, said. no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure where where I got cut off there. But the last thing I was just going to say though was, don't be afraid as, as parents and, and and also to reassure students in this that if you want more information, and we will we will of course speak to you. It's not like we're, we're just going to say we can't talk to you at all. We will of course speak to you and give you general information. But it's just what we won't do is give any information. Uh, about a, about a particular student. We won't get into discussing specifically a student issue, but we will give you loads of information about the supports and about um, if, if an issue is said in general about who to connect with, whether it's ourselves or a tutor or thing. We, we will, of course, give that kind of advice, but we will never go into the specifics of the student, just to say that. Yeah, um, will I go on to another question? Um, okay. Uh, so someone asked with assignments and essays, will we be instructed initially in what format would be appropriate to write in or are we expected to know already? So I might give this to Alison. Okay, well, that's, that's a tough one, Cormac, because the, the, the truthful answer is that depends. That depends on the person who's teaching you. Um, some academic stuff, and this is where you've got to really engage with your virtual learning environment, your Blackboard or Moodle or what have you, because generally speaking, inside every module, there'll be all the lecture notes and, and handouts and readings, etc. But there'll also often be, uh, right, your assignment task, and some of those can be very specific. Your assignment is to write 750 words on this topic. You may use bullet points. Uh, ensure that you reference correctly. So you might have a lecturer who gives you all of that information. You might equally get somebody who just says, choose from the following two questions and write an essay. Don't be afraid to ask the question, whether it be at the end of a lecture or whether it be you know, sending them an email and it could be something uh, like, sorry, I just wanted to check with you. Uh, what format do, would you like this in? Do you want this in an essay or do you want it in note form? Or, you know, I'm just looking for some, for some help here. Um, it's quite useful then to, after the first time you submitted something and it's come back to you, then you can come and ask the question, like, I thought I did a good job here and I don't really understand um, what went wrong. And we'll help you out. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, but um, yeah, no, it definitely does uh, differ to like all my lectures for very different styles. Um, but it is uh, it is good to know that you know you're not alone with not knowing how to because referencing and stuff like that that's definitely going to be so new if you're just coming from school as well. So um, it can be a bit uh, of a challenge, but there is supports there. So I'm just going to go on to this other question uh, about uh, if I don't use social media should I start to access resources from the college so um, yeah like I, I would just say that you know most uh, universities won't just rely on social media to um, provide information it's definitely a uh, an extra, uh, more of an add-on, but the more important information, you can definitely find it on, say, your university's website, or you can find it on your disability services uh, website, or also uh, communication through email. Um, I wouldn't worry if you don't have social media, as you know, that mightn't be for everyone either, but it's definitely uh, just um, more reminders when you have social media. I don't know, Alison, do you have your hand up again or is that just from the last time? Sorry, it's from the last time, but, <laughs> but I'll just add to that. And that's a really interesting question. Actually, one of the most important things you're going to learn is how to be a researcher because you are going to have to engage in research from the get go. That's researching information for your essays, but that includes really digging down and mining all of your course information. Go on your course website, download everything that you can read, go on to the latest news, events, go to the student's union. The more exploration and research that you do, the more knowledgeable you will be and the more knowledge you have, the more confident you will be. Yeah, good point. Um, my Zoom is currently frozen, so I can see 
kind of open the question and answers. I don't know if anybody else can see them if they want to ask a question. Well, um, I'll just say uh, there's one in from uh, Jacqueline. Um, if a student who enters under the DARE umbrella is struggling, but not aware that they're struggling, will you reach out to them? Well, you give that to Kieran. Yeah, I can. I can answer that. Um, the answer. The answer is, I suppose, it's, it's, there's it's, there's layers to the answer. It's not that we would have immediate access to a student's results. And we're checking on every result the whole way through, and and to really identify, um, we need to follow up with with the student because of it. But, um, within a lot of colleges, and 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 I suppose this comes through. Again, Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm back there now. Sorry, but um, just I was just saying that it it comes back to your point earlier, Ken, around our connection with departments. That it, it's the departments who will know the best, and that's where we look for, for departments and for tutors or the students themselves to to come to us. I suppose we don't we don't generally instigate that contact, but what we do, what we do do is around tutors come in and 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 all students we do reach out at an individual level and uh. I suppose a, a whole student body level a lot to say that we're there, but but in terms of us actively going, a student has 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 something or has missed something that we would actively intervene straight away. No, we generally look for that to come from from a course. That's where they'll have the discussion first is with their course and in Trinity with their with their tutor or somebody like that, and then perhaps it will come back to us that way. I think that's a really important point because fundamentally it's not the same as school where all staff might be aware. We we don't see, as Karen said, we don't see the a students' results, so we wouldn't necessarily be aware that they're that they're struggling. Um, so I, I guess that could I maybe just uh, just so not saying you define the question, but um could an, an academic staff come back and say, look, I think this student is struggling. Um, I don't know why. I think they may have a condition. And talk to you guys, and then you pick up the ball. Yeah, they, they, the academic staff. And I suppose that's where I say that we're there to, there to support the academic staff to, to support students and to have that discussion. It's, it's, not, it's not to immediately be assuming that or that that everyone is, is assuming on for a student in that in that incident, but we would hope that the staff would have the conversation with the student first, and the, but then would come looking for support as well or direct the student. And, and I suppose the way we have done we have done that is, and I know we, uh, Ashton referred to when students have to come and register and you, you upload documentation. We, we also have, I suppose, and, and any disability service will have this or any services will have this. It's just a drop in, just to go in and talk and staff and even for a staff member so we'll have that a lot where students will come and go to lectures suggested uh based upon an assignment or based upon something that would be good to go, go and talk to you and even explore that and so even before you get to the stage of of, of fully registrate with the service or putting in accommodations to at least come and explore it and have that conversation yeah absolutely that's and that's a really important and to be honest it's something that we're seeing increasingly more year and year that that's what we need to open ourselves up to more and more is not just those students who register or come in through there but those students who just aren't sure entirely well obviously just we are having a conversation and that jackie who put the original questions then come back to sort of refine it like um she should have said or she says and um, i should have said it's not struggling academically but in general and um, someone who's on the academic spectrum and they're struggling with you know just general student life so would that be picked up by someone else within the college and come back to yourselves Yeah. I suppose it's, yeah. it's quite a similar scenario where, where it might be um, and I suppose because we do a lot of work to try and engage with lots of different members of the university community whether that be the services like Ethna mentioned the career service or our colleagues in the counselling service academic departments um, we've been engaging with you know even students in the student union or in clubs and societies around accessibility 
disability and inclusion that we hope that they're able to at times pick up when maybe somebody could do with a little bit of extra support and and maybe mention us or recommend that they do come and talk to us or uh, as Karen mentioned attend one of our drop-ins but it is uh, as Alison mentioned it's it's not always the case that we will be aware that a student is struggling if they're not engaging with us already in some way um, we do sometimes rely on the, the, the student to come and connect with us or um, that's why we, we do a lot of work to ensure that others are aware of us and what we do so that they might suggest it to, to a student if they see that they're having difficulty. Just it's important as well to mention that whilst we do rely on students to come to us and initiate that contact, we also do check in. I know Alison mentioned it there as well. We check in quite regularly with students each semester to, to talk and you know, to ask if they do need any support. And we are kind of flexible on how we check in as well. So if we do have maybe a phone call with a student, often it is the case that I might I might not hear anything from a student until they actually hear a voice on the other side of the phone. And then that's when they might maybe initiate that contact then initiate that discussion around supports as well and I suppose the drop-in drop -in offers that opportunity as well sometimes students don't in they don't interact well with email and that's no problem but if they have if they can come to the drop-in and they have someone sitting across the table to discuss that with them and whether it is a phone call or whether it is an online meeting um change that will, will connect those students then in with the service um, and connect them then with the supports that we have available then as well I'll pass on to you there. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why Claire actually set up, you know, the autism support group was to, you know, an informal way of encouraging. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Claire? Yeah, that is, that is a good um, a good point to raise. So as part of our neurodivergent project, um, we have set up specific supports, uh, that, such as there is an autism drop in group for students, and that is a weekly meetup um, at the same time every week it's at the moment it's currently online um, but you know we may get the opportunity to go back and meet in person soon hopefully um, but that is an opportunity for students to avail of the supports um, I facilitate that group so I am there to advise on supports and to pick up on maybe any areas where students would like to connect one-to-one -one outside of the group if they do need additional accommodations or if they do maybe need something like a referral to occupational therapy um, but it's also there's a there's a peer support element to it as well so students might be coming along to talk about what their experiences are at college and and might problem solve any challenges that they're experiencing that they'll share advice and tips amongst themselves and um, they'll share you know suggestions for supports or you know different resources in college that students can engage with if they're if they're looking to achieve something or if you know if there's a need there so um so that group does serve those functions some of the students are coming along for the social part and um, to have a peer group to get the the peer support some of them are coming along to avail of the support from uh the, the occupational therapy for the, or from the disability service point of view um so that's that's a really good way of students staying connected to each other, but also to us. Thanks, Claire. Uh, I think we're going to wrap this up now. I just want to say um, I hope that this was helpful for all attendees. And as you probably gathered from all of us speaking, we're here to help and your disability service is also here to help as well. So um, if you're in Trinity or you come to Trinity, you can email askds at tc.e and you'll be able to find information on your disability service probably online on their website and you can email them there. They'll be more than happy to help. And I'll pass back over to Ken. Okay, well, again, thank you very much for that. Um, I was just seeing there, there was a question in from Colin, but I think um, Alison has just actually just typed the answer there. So well done, thank you very much for that. Um, if we're all, that's great. Um, Again, thanks to everybody who came along tonight and a huge thanks, as I say, you've got the whole um, occupational and uh, disability support from Trinity here tonight. And you can see the holistic support that's gone into that. And um, not saying that's in every college, larger colleges, smaller colleges, 
Um, but if you are going to college, and I think one of the big messages is out there, there's supports there. And if you go and ask them, you get them. So with that, thank you very much. Really appreciate your support. And we'll see you at our, another webinar we have next week on the science of happiness and um, from Professor Brendan Kelly, also in Trinity. Thank you very much. I hope you all have a great evening. Bye.